So, ladies and dreams, today is Wednesday, August 22, in the neighborhood at 1 o'clock. We have some questions to be asked and some answers to be found. Um, just a little noodling to get the cameras going here. The, question, the first question was er answered last time we were here, and I didn't get a chance to uh, answer it. But the question dealt with a teacher in Australia, I think, who has a, a prodigy for students and uh, asked me some recommendations on how to, uh, how to teach this person. Uh, I guess he thinks I could have some important ideas. We'll see what he thinks when he hears them <laughs> and how the student responds to this kind of commentary. But working with Tony Williams for five years when he was 17 on the scene, I kind of got an idea of uh, some of the things. I enjoyed playing with Tony and, and sharing as a guy who was older, of course. Uh, one of the things Tony was aware of that I encouraged was to understand song form. How many bars in the first part of the tune? Uh, was there eight bars? Was there a second ending? Was there a first ending? Uh, what key was this song in, and how did it affect the drum sound with the bass? Uh, how did he tune the bass drum? Uh, I like the really bright snare drum so the bass range wouldn't be affected by the snare drum the rhythm he would play. He had some wonderful symbols. He was aware of these kinds of uh, musical details that made my job playing with him less of a job and more of an adventure night in and night out. I don't know how good this young man plays the bass, so my comment is just on those kind of general things, but I would have this student, whoever he is, I assume it's a he, sorry ladies, um, understand how the bass works. I have a course I call Bass 101A with everyone who stands in this place here, and my job is to let them know this is how the bass physically functions. I think so, much, so many of us are not aware of what we're playing and the results of how we play the bass, or where we hold the left hand and the right hand, and what kind of sound that gives us if the bass changes with the weather and the air conditioning and the nightclubs and the travel. I think it's important to understand that part of what, we're, what we have to be faced with on a nightly basis. And given the fact that we can't take our bass on most gigs as we travel, it's even more important to have a, a game plan that allows us to make this bass feel kind of like ours without us, without literally fixing the bass. Uh, my last comment to this young person would go out and hear other people play. How do they see the problems of the bass he may be confronting? Uh, how do they fix them on the bandstand? Uh, what kind of library do they play? Uh, what kind of strings do they play? Uh, how early are they get to the gig before they start to play? Are they aware of the instrument changing texture and, and, and intensity and intention during the course of the gig, depending on whether there's air conditioning blowing on the bass or whether the lights are hot than they were at the sound check? Uh, these seem like kind of boilerplate commentary for this young person, but maybe the teacher can explain to him that go from an old guy who still plays the antique bass, maybe he'll find something to do with that. Okay, enough fooling around. <laughs> Here's some real questions now. We have a question from Paulo Santos. Okay. Hi, Ron. I was wondering if there is anything that can't be learned from transcribing solos slash walking. I'd like to hear your thoughts about that. Uh, this question has come up almost a couple of times. And my general view of, of transcriptions is not a, a favorable one, unfortunately, for those who love transcriptions. I think those transcriptions that they use, including mine, are, are based on a, a perfect setting. The drummer had the right sound at the right time. The piano player didn't play at the right time. This ideal chorus may in fact be the third attempt to get it right. You know? uh, having said that, the idea of being able to do that has always been a, a, an interesting thing to me, that kind of skill level of listening to you get it right without playing it and doing it like this with a pencil and paper. I think one of the things you can learn from transcriptions, however, is where did this person find those notes? What hand was he in the left hand to know that these notes that he's aiming for are a half step away? 
or half step this way. These choices of where he lands his hand physically affect his choice of notes. So while they may seem pretty far removed from the scheme of things, based on where he started this line physically, made these notes that he finally found much more able to be found. The hope, of course, is that they're the right notes. I mean, that's a constant worry for all of us. And, and uh, uh, the thing that I found that's most easily gained from doing transcriptions is where did he find those notes? How he got to them and how he left them. Questions from Vince Dupont. Hey, uh, Vince, what's up? <laughs> Hi, Mr. Carter. You're welcome. What was it like playing and recording with Coleman Hawkins? You know, I was, that was early in my days of, in New York, and Mr. Hawkins had a, a Chrysler 300C, which is a sports car at that time, a four-door sports car. And he rang my doorbell, and then I came down to the, to the uh, car, and uh, this brilliant-looking guy, man, with his voice was like an octave below the bass. Hi, Mr. Carter. I'm Coleman Hawkins. And I said, Hi, Mr. Hawkins. <laughs> Can I help you? He said, yeah, we were going to make some record of music out of Rudy's. You been there before? I said, yes, sir. I've been out there like uh, two weeks ago with a project. Well, we're going to try it again, OK? Get in my car and let's go to work, young man. Coleman Hawkins. He really played great, too, man. We have a question from Sam, Sam Aubouchon. Uh, what's the best advice you have for creating really solid and good timing walking bass lines? Knowing the changes. For as easy as the answer is to come to my mouth, that's one of the most difficult things to do is to understand the form. It's hard to construct a building if you have no plan. Once I understand what the form of the song is and what are the highlights of this tune, that maybe a certain chord at the bridge that says, here's the bridge coming up again, or the second ending of the first part. These road marks, these landmarks, allow me to build a bass line that makes these parts of the tune really highlighted, like, a, like a, a, an orange lighter that this is the bridge coming up. I think without this concept and knowledge of how the tune works and what the changes are that makes this tune do what it does, it's hard to build a constructive bass line night in and night out. We trust with luck. We all do. But that's not enough sometimes. Thanks. We have a question from Amory Clements. How do you stay in such great shape physically? Diet, exercise, etc. I've had a trainer come to me for the past 30 years who comes to me uh, three days a week uh, at uh, 6 a.m. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And that's not including the nights I work. If I get home at 1 o'clock in the morning at 5.45, I've got one house shoe on and one gym shoe on and half of a shirt ready to go to work when this guy comes at 6 o'clock. I've been doing this for over 30 years. I've kind of been careful what I eat because as you travel, you can never get a, a real solid dietary plan. Not really. And uh, I'm more inclined to miss a meal than eat a meal I shouldn't be eating. And uh, that kind of helps me maintain the semblance of uh, me, night in and night out. Thanks. We have a question from Mendes Armando. What kind of preamp and pickups do you use and recommend? That's uh, uh, a difficult question to answer until I see and hear your bass. They're all responding differently to the same gear. Right now, I've, I've, I've fallen in love with the David Gage uh, sound clip, which I use to travel with. And the, the, the latest one, as you'll see later on, uh, fits in, the, in between the top and the bottom here. Uh, they're just to stay, it's able to capture the real essence of the bass without having the electronic sound that some pickups have. Uh, I recommend that you give him a call or find out where his gear is located and, and uh, experiment with the three types that he has, and you will find, as I do, that they're the best on the market. Ivan Torres, hi Ron, any tip to stop depending on the root while playing walking bass? I, mean, I love the roots, man, you know. Uh, occasionally I'll tell a guy, you want some roots, you have to go to the market. I'm not playing them today, you know. Uh, one of the things that makes roots important is not playing them. And, and uh, I kind of like guys, I like to play with people who insist on hearing them. I love those people. My job is to make them stop wanting to do that. <laughs> and I'm not bad at that, you know. Uh, but roots are important in the chord. There's no question. You have to know how to spell the chord past the root. 
if you keep playing F all night, the guy says, man, he knows one note, F, but there are three others kind of involved in that sound, you know. Uh, a shorter answer is to learn how to spell the chords and understand what each note has the value to make that chord sound this way or that way, this way. But don't depend on the root to give you that sound. James Joyner, uh, I recently found a copy of Aretha Franklin, Soul 69 oh, yeah. on LP at yeah. my record store, yeah. local record store, and I saw your post on this album a few days ago. Do you have any memories of this concert? Uh, it was recording Atlantic, for Atlantic Records with Arif Martin, who was the producer. Uh, people only knew her to see be a gospel singer, you know, and, and uh, that always bothers me because she's such a wonderful singer who happens to sing gospel tunes, you know. And she walks into this date with all these hot jazz players, man, and they're, they're just as surprised to see her as she is enjoying them being surprised, you know. And the nice arrangements. We walk in there all sight reading the music, not seen it before that one o'clock start. And then we know we have from one to six to make this record with this fantastic singer. And everyone sits down and takes care of business as she deserves to have her, her kind of attention. Uh, John Newman played some great solos on that record. Just the sound of the studio today was a great sound for all of us. And uh, I did some couple of things with her for those diva programs at Radio City when they were going around like 10 years or so ago. And she's just, she was just the cream of the crop. And, and uh, everyone had to stop. And she walked, when she walked by, we all stopped because she commanded that kind of uh, R-E-S, P-C-C, yeah, that, 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 that. <laughs> nice lady. Simon Bassertoth. Uh, Simon says, okay, I know Simon that's Simon says, yeah. how often do you play bow? I'm really interested. Uh, it depends on the project. Uh, I had a student come in this morning who was curious about why I didn't teach that, you know? And my answer to him is that you, Mr. Stewart, I won't give, give you his name, are here to learn to kind of do what I do, and that's not with the bow. You know? you're, you're here to understand how chords work, how to make bass lines, how to have a good time, how to have a good sound. None of that involves using the work despite what people tell you. you know? uh, I have a lot of classical experience. I've been in classical orchestras. I've been chamber groups. I've done artful work. And because and, uh, I don't do it on a nightly visual basis, people assume that I don't have that skill level. Shame on them. Sandy Aldrich. Simon doesn't say anymore. OK. okay. <laughs> You spoke before about uh, finding the right notes in certain positions. What are the main positions on the bass, in your opinion, and what exercises do you practice in these positions? They're all main. There's not one main position. There's, there's one we use all the time, but they are no more main than what kind of end pin rubber you use on the end pin. Uh, I, I think rather than have a bass player think of a main position on the bass, I'd rather see him or her think of what position am I in now and what notes are available without having to move. If he or she can conceive of that option, then they understand that there's no one main position. They all become a main position. We have a question from Eddie Backton. Okay. Um, thank you for your contributions, Mr. Carter. I've been listening to your work since I was a kid in the 60s. I'd like to ask you a question I once asked Marcus Miller. Mm -hmm. I suspect you learned a lot from Miles Davis. However, what are a couple of things Miles learned from you? Um, one of the things he learned from me was that I'm in it every night. When the downbeat came up, I was all over it. And I wasn't going to let it go until I was tired of hearing it. He understood that. Uh, number two, I think he understood that I was aware of what bass notes do to a whole note. And he would also hold it, get a note and hold it for you know, eight or nine beats. Well, my job for me was to make that note do something for those eight or nine beats. And wherever it came out to be, he was stuck with it because he held on to that note. He was the precious paid man is this. <laughs> this, is, this is the cost of that note. And, and uh, he understood that I meant that. And because I was so into that kind of playing, uh, we both grew together. And thanks, it's a great question. Thank you. Milos Cholovic. Hello, Mr. Carter. Can Hello. you share something about your Empire Jazz album? Were you a Star Wars fan when it came out, or were you only impressed by the soundtrack? 
Well, I was uh, impressed by the producer of the record, uh, which was me. There's a lot of work. The melodies were not complete when I asked the composer to send them to me so I could find out what they really sounded like outside of the studio, the, the movie studio, grandiose sound, you know, John Williams, a great writer and great music. Uh, what I enjoyed was putting together this kind of band with Bob James and, and uh, Hubert Laws and, and, and um, Jay Berliner, Billy Cobham. It was a wonderful band. And, and the thing about that record that was interesting to me that the cover of it, the guy said, you can't show the, the uh, Star Wars characters having any liquor on the tables. I said, okay. <laughs> I can do that because that's your job. That's not mine, you know. <laughs> and and uh, it sold really well. And unfortunately, Joe Shepley, who was on that record, passed away last year. And I was hoping to have it reissued when the new, when the last Star Wars series came about, and no one could find out who had the master because the the Stigwood company that produced it, no one could find. He's just he's, he's no longer with us. And the label got shifted around, they buying this label, bought that label, and this label, bought that label, and ultimately no one won to accept the responsibility to say, yeah, it's a good record, man, let it go out. So I'm still having hopes that uh, at some point some guy said, well, man, what about this jazz guy? What's his name? Ron Jackson, Ron something, Ron something. He's got this record called The uh, Empire Strikes. Let me try that, and we'll see what happens. You know? Soon. And we have a last question from okay. Burak Sulumbas. You have played a lot of recordings as a sideman, but I wonder what is your favorite recording as a leader? It should, it should, probably, it should be probably hard to pick one, but I'm sure one could be special. Uh, Thank you for your advices. Yeah, I, I kind of uh, don't answer those questions specifically because inherent to my answer is that the others aren't as good. And I'm not a fan of that kind of concept. <laughs> I bust my chops to play good on all those records, and sometimes some, the, success is, the, se the success of my efforts is a little more obvious, and sometimes it's less obvious, you know. But my answer generally is because I'm playing with such high-quality players, and I'm playing with people who treasure a good performance so much, and players who expect me to bring another air to this music that helps them find notes that maybe they thought weren't available to them, or a concept that they don't understand how it works, or what it's like to play with these kind of bass notes behind them. All these projects involve people like that. And for me, if the record only sold six copies, for me it was physically successful, because they all trusted my judgment. Fortunately, they sold like 12, so it was okay, you know? <laughs> We can go to guess the baseline. Now. Okay, here we go. Yeah, here's the tune again for this week, and the the prize is a Ron Carter T-shirt. It's black with white with a picture of my logo, just like this. It's a nice shot, a nice view, and uh, it's a very good cotton. So here's a song, and let's see who can guess it.
Okay. Good luck. You got a lot of compliments, but no right answer yet. Yay! I got <laughs> Finally, somebody didn't get it. No, no, no right, no right answer yet. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. We're okay. still waiting for it. Okay. Done? What up? Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and germs, see you uh, this time a month from now. Thanks for your cards and letters and phone calls and stuff, and uh, keep buying the records. Thanks. Have a good day. <laughs>